the university and kept it running in its early years. And it's also worth noting that those enslaved laborers were forced to build the university. And in fact, all of Charlottesville is constructed on land that uh, is originally that of the Monacan people. Uh, and they are indigenous to the Piedmont and Appalachian areas of Virginia. And they were the original and traditional custodians of this land. So all of that is to say that Although we're very proud of the institution that the university has become and is becoming, it has a complicated history, and that history is sometimes difficult to acknowledge and grapple with, and it can be painful, but we think it's also important. And students can really dig into that history in a number of different ways when they're here. Uh, one that I really like is that there are courses offered on the university specifically and on Thomas Jefferson. And so maybe if one day one of you become a university student, that might be something that would interest you. I would highly encourage that. Uh, but in the modern day, University is a four-year public research institution here in Charlottesville, Virginia. We have about 16,000 undergraduate students, as you can see there. Um, and you will also notice that there's a bit of an imbalance between Virginians and non-Virginians. And I'm going to launch a poll just to see where all of y'all are from. But the reason that you see that imbalance is because we are a public state school, and part of our purpose is to serve the students in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so that imbalance between Virginians and non-Virginians is very intentional, and you'll see that come up again in our admission process, which I'll touch on later. But even though we are a, a state school, right, that doesn't mean that we are a school completely of Virginians. And as I anticipate, there will be students from all over the country and the world attending this session, as there are for many of the sessions, and in fact, as there are in our student body. So I'm going to see where everybody's from. Okay. Yeah, see, we have students from all over uh, the United States. We have a couple joining us from outside the United States. So, so like I said, we, even though we are a public state school, we really have an international student body. Um, so that's interesting to see as well. I know there are a lot of numbers on this slide, but the one that I really want to draw your attention to that we are very proud of is our graduation rate. As you can see, it's 95%, uh, and that's the highest among any public university in the United States. And if you look closer at that number, you'd see that we have the highest Black and African American graduation rate of any public school as well. And I think that that's because, not just because we admit amazing students who are prone to succeed, right, but also because we try and create an environment here that's conducive to student success. And that can t look like a lot of different things. It could be a writing center in one of the libraries, peer mentoring programs run out of the Office of African American Affairs or Multicultural Student Services, mentorships that are set up between faculty and students. So, all of these things are set up to help students not only just get here, but succeed when they're here and ultimately graduate, which is the, the end goal there. Now, uh, the university itself is actually an umbrella term for all of the different undergraduate schools that we have here, undergraduate and graduate schools, actually. And so when you are initially applying to the university, uh, with one exception that I'll mention, you're going to be picking one of these schools to apply to and not a specific major. Uh, these schools on the left are the options that you would have. And so I'm going to quickly go over where uh, each of these kind of fit into the landscape of the university. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory a lot of the times, but the first that you see there on the left excuse me, is the College of Arts and Sciences. And of the 16,000 undergraduate students we have here, about 11,000 of them are in the College of Arts and Sciences. And that is because the college has the widest range of options, and that's where a lot of students will find their academic home. So if you are undecided, uh, that is completely fine. No one, uh, apart from one exception, which I'll talk about, co actually comes into the university with a declared major. So if you are completely undecided, though, and you have absolutely no idea, I encourage students to apply to the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, conversely, if students 
really, really know where they want to go. And a lot of times those are what I call pre-students, pre-professional students, whether that's pre-vet or pre-med or pre-law. Those students also typically come out of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, students don't have to declare a major for two years, up to two years in the college. So again, the, it allows for the most flexibility and that's where I would encourage students to apply who, who really don't know. And if students are curious, you can double major and that is not uncommon. Um, it's, it's less common. But it's very common, for example, to double major in the College of Arts and Sciences. Now, the next option you see there is the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Pretty self-explanatory. It's for students who are interested in engineering. Again, students don't actually enter the engineering school with a particular major, so it's fine if you don't know what discipline of engineering you'd like to study. But during the first year in the e-school, students are taking basically all of the same fundamental engineering and STEM classes. Uh, which expose them to all of the different disciplines that are available in the School of Engineering. So civil engineering, mechanical engineering, aerospace, biomedical, all that good stuff. And at the end of the first year, that's when students actually decide what it, their major in the School of Engineering will be. So that's engineering. Next, you'll see the School of Architecture. Um, that obviously deals with the built environment, designing buildings and what the built environment looks like. Um, and, and there are three majors there, architecture, architectural history, and then uh, urban and environmental planning. And so that's for students who are interested uh, in any of those things. But I would also encourage students to uh, kind of broaden their thinking about what the, the A school could offer. There's also a design thinking program there which deals with the, the thinking behind design. And so that's also an option for students there. Next, you'll see the School of Nursing. Again, pretty self-explanatory for students who are interested in nursing. And at this point, I would discourage anyone who's not specifically interested in nursing from applying to that school. So all of my pre-med students, that's not where you want to go. The nursing school is looking for students who want to be lifelong care providers. And it's a direct entry school. Students spend all four years in the nursing school. They start their clinical hours in their second year. Uh, and so, again, that is for students who are specifically interested in, in nursing. And then lastly is the School of Education's kinesiology program. And that is the only major that you're actually able to apply directly into. It's for students who are interested in studying kinesiology, which is the study of the human body and its movement. So that'll often be students who are interested in physical or, or occupational therapy or maybe sports medicine. And it's actually housed the department in one of our athletic facilities and students are able to uh, participate in those labs if they want if they want as an undergraduate. And I think some of those labs, I think there's like a range of motion type tests. And I think there's, a, there's also a concussion institute there. So all of that is available for the kinesiology students. Now on the right, you'll see some of our upper divisional schools, which are schools that students have access to once they come to the university. So typically students will enter through one of these other schools. Most of the time it's the College of Arts and Sciences. And then they have the option to apply to and, and attend uh, some of these other schools on the right that you see for the rest of their time at the university. And that includes the McIntyre School of Commerce, which is our undergraduate school of business, the School of Education, which I've already mentioned, outside of the kinesiology program, it's for students who are interested in teaching as a profession or being a leader in education. And then uh, you'll also see the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy that has both graduate and undergraduate degrees in public policy. The School of Data Science is on this list, but they're not currently offering uh, undergraduate degrees, but that is a, a school that students can take courses in and eventually they will de develop an undergraduate program. So. Those are the options that students have when they're initially applying. And kind of the timeline for applications is what I'll talk about next. Um, we're actually getting towards the middle of the timeline for this current application cycle. And there are a couple of things I want to point out. First, at the bottom are the different kinds of deadlines that you'll see, early decision, early action, and regular decision. 
uh, early decision is for students who know 100% that the university is the place where they where they want to go. Because if you apply early decision, then and you are admitted early decision, then you are required to attend, uh, barring any financial circumstance. And so early decision is a binding decision, and that's important for students to understand. We also have early action, which is non-binding, uh, but it's for students who maybe they have their materials together early, they want to be notified early. And so again, it's non-binding, but that is another option that students have. And then regular decision is for students who uh, maybe they didn't hear about the university before the other deadlines, uh, which are due at the beginning of November, November 1st. Um, but for regular decision students, they might have just discovered us, like I said, or maybe they want us to see their grades so far in 12th grade uh, when we are initially evaluating their application. So that's also regular decision, um, regular decision there. But uh, at the end of this entire timeline, I know we're often interested in the numbers, and this is kind of what uh, the application process for us ultimately yields. Last year, we got over 40,000 applications, and you'll see that the admission rate between in-state and out-of-state students is, is different. And again, that goes back to what I was talking about so far as our student population is concerned. Um, and that is because we are looking to maintain a two-thirds to one-third ratio Virginians to non-Virginians in our incoming classes. So if you um, are applying actually one-third of those spots um, of our incoming class. But unfortunately for out-of-state students, the majority of our applications are from out-of-state students. And so our offer rate necessarily has to be lower. Um, but I do want to see where, that reminds me, where people in Virginia are coming from. Again, um, we are state school, so I'm interested to see that we also get students from all across um, Virginia. But like I said, you'll see here um, the kind of raw numbers that we're dealing with. And for anyone who's interested, all of our numbers are public on our website, so I highly encourage you to go. You can really dig into it uh, there if you're interested in that. Um, I also want to point out that you see there 90% of the students that we ultimately enroll were in the top 10% of their graduating class. So we're really looking for, for high achieving students, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. So let's see where we have in Virginia. Okay. Yeah, different regions of Virginia, a lot from Northern Virginia, that is expected. Okay, great. Now behind the numbers here is an application process and an, and an, an evaluation process that we go through. And we try and be very thoughtful and very careful and very thorough in our evaluation of every application that we get. And we use what's called a holistic reading process. So everything that you submit to us, we read and we consider before we make uh, a decision on a particular application. And those things in and transcripts and things like that, but I'm going to talk about each part um, of what we're, we're looking at. And I'll first talk about letters of recommendation and essays. Um, which uh, are required for our application. We require two letters of recommendation, one from a teacher and one from a counselor. Um, again, only two. If you want to submit another, another letter, that's fine, but the record that we have received is in the upper 30s for the numbers of letter of recommendations that we get. And we do not, we do not need that many letters from you. Um, like I said, one counselor and one teacher, we prefer that teacher be in a core academic subject area um, and one that is typically uh, the higher level of whatever is available at your school. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what teachers you want to ask to write your letters of recommendation. And then we also ask for you to write some letters, uh, some essays for us, excuse me. And all of this is through the common application, which is how you apply to the university. So you have to write three essays for us. One is just a personal statement in the common app. And then there are two UVA specific questions. One will be to the school that you're applying to. It'll be a, a specific prompt for a, your specific school. And then there's a list of prompts that you can choose to respond to. What is your favorite word? 
Um, there's a question about your quirks, those sorts of things. So, so these are, are things that you get to choose what you want to share with us. And we don't have interviews here at the university. So essays are really how we're able to hear you and your voice and what it is that you care about and how you engage with ideas. So really take care when you are crafting these essays, because that's ultimately, I think, I mean, they're my favorite part of the application. And I think also how we're able to most personally connect with applicants. Um, aside from these two things, we're also looking for students who are involved in their communities. So any activities that you have, we'll also ask for a list of those. And that can include, of course, the sports and school-related clubs that you do at your specific high school. But they can include things outside of that as well. Your jobs, if you play a significant role in raising a sibling, if you're a caretaker to a family member. All of these things are things that we want to know. We want to know what you're doing outside of class. And so please, please, please share those with us. Um, but don't feel like you have to list everything you've ever done, right? Let us know what is important to you and how you uh, most meaningfully engage with your community. Now, we also um, can consider testing. Uh, obviously, this year, given the pandemic and some students' inability to take the test, we are test optional for the 2020 to 2021 application year. Um, uh, and so we'll reevaluate that process um, when we start uh, again uh, the next application cycle next year. Um, but for students who apply under a test optional policy, your application is not harmed in any way by not choosing to submit your, uh, your test scores. Of course, if you think that they reflect your academic abilities, and by all means do that, but that is not required at all. Um, and these are kind of the ranges that we have typically seen from students before when they're trying to consider whether or not they should submit scores. These are typically the ranges that we see. They're middle 50% ranges, so 25% of students scored lower, 25 higher. But uh, those are the ranges for those. And then although I said that we have a holistic reading process, which we do, the very most important, the most important part of the application is the high school transcript. Um, and, and that is really, the, like I said, the most important part of the application. We want to admit students who are able to succeed and thrive here. And so the classes that you've taken and the grades that you earned are really how we're best able to do that. We're looking for students have, who have taken the most rigorous courses available at their high school across all of the different subject areas. So even if you are applying to the School of Engineering, we still want to see that you have the highest level of English available at your school, for example, in social studies. If you plan on majoring in studio art, we still want to see that you've taken the highest level math and science available at your school. Uh, and so, again, these are really evaluated based on what's available to you. So if your school has AP courses, those are, pro those are likely the highest level at your school. Um, and these are conversations that you can have with your counselor about what the most rigorous course of study is. Again, uh, we want to make sure that we're bringing students here who are able to, to succeed and thrive in the classroom. Okay, so that's the transcript and profile. And so when you submit all of those things, that is what we use to evaluate your application. I quickly want to mention financial aid, um, because that is also a consideration that many students have when they are considering where they might eventually want to go to school. Uh, we are very fortunate in that we're one of two public schools in the country that's able to meet 100% of demonstrated need for all of our students in state and out of state, all of our domestic students. Um, and we're very proud of that. And so I know that there can often be sticker shock when it comes to looking at some of the, the prices for these schools and the cost of tuition. But when you are applying, you're also submitting financial information, which we as the admission committee don't actually see. Um, but our financial aid office uses that to give you your financial aid package, which you will get uh, with your offer letter um, or your decision letter whenever, whenever that comes, if you're able to submit those materials in time. So that's my plug for financial aid. I'm happy to talk about that more. If you all have questions about that, put them in the Q&A box. Um, and then finally, I guess I'll just mention the different ways that you can get in contact with us. Um, we are UVA Admission on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And you can also um, 
call our office, email our office. Those are also provided there. And you'll hear from the students in just one second. But those things in orange are how you can contact actual, actual students. So feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email if you have any questions that aren't answered during this session. We're always happy to engage with you in that way. And with that, I will turn it over to some of our current students who are going to talk about the student experience, and then I'll come back for the Q&A session. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Ben. I am a current third year student here at UVA, uh, and I'm double majoring in music and political and social thought. I'm here at home in Pleasantville, New York on winter break right now. Um, and I'm going to start you guys off on our student experience tour. So first, just to talk about academics a little bit. Um, as Tim mentioned, we have a bunch of different schools that you can apply into at the University of Virginia. But in general, if you are undecided in what you want to study, the College of Arts and Sciences is your best bet. From there, you can either transfer into another school if need be, or you can major in anything ranging from drama and music to politics to chemistry or biology. Um, overall, the college is where you'll find most of the majors at UVA. Um, I think the best part about majoring in something at UVA while we're on that topic is that in the College of Arts and Sciences, you have until the second semester of your second year um, to declare that major, and you can have up to two majors and up to two minors. Um, in other programs like the School of Architecture and the School of Engineering, for example, you also still have time to choose your majors. Uh, in some cases, you might need to choose by the end of your first year just due to the rigor of those programs. But no matter what, when you come into the university, if you don't know exactly what you want to major in, it's really not a problem. The um, general, curric general education curriculums at UVA encourage you to take a wide variety of classes and really hone in on your passions and discover a wide array of academic subjects that maybe you weren't aware of in high school. Um, for example, I had no clue that <laughs> the major political and social thought even existed when I applied to UVA, and ultimately I ended up um, applying to that and deciding to major in it at the end of my second year. So while we're on this slide, I also would like to talk about class sizes. So this is a picture of a larger lecture hall at UVA. And looking at this image, you might be thinking, oh, gosh, that kind of looks like a large class size, especially if you're like me and you came from a smaller high school. You might be concerned about interacting with your professors or just if all of your classes will be large lectures. I can say with certainty that they absolutely won't be. Most of the classes I've taken at UVA have been 40 students or less. In a lot of cases recently, as you get into your majors, 15 to 20 students or maybe even less. Um, a lot of your larger lecture courses will come through courses like microeconomics or an introductory chemistry course. And even in those larger lecture sections of, say, 300 people, you'll still have a discussion or lab section, which is usually led by a graduate student TA. And these are just times when you can come together with about 15 to 20 other students and discuss challenging material from the week, maybe go over some homework questions, or just really dive into the material that you're learning. Um, these are great because they provide an opportunity to not only get to know your professors better, but get to know um, other students in your class better and maybe even form study groups to help you outside of class. Um, something that's been really, really helpful um, with professors in my experience at UVA is also getting to know them via office hours, which currently, since we're in a hybrid format for UVA, are held on Zoom. But um, in the pre-COVID era, they were held in professors' actual offices in the different academic spaces on grounds. And one of the best parts about this is that you could go speak to a professor about maybe something that was challenging you in class or a difficult concept you wanted to review, but you could also just get to know them as a person, maybe what their research interests are at UVA or ways that you can get involved in the work that they're doing, or if you just need someone to talk to and get advice about maybe your academic path at UVA or different majors and job opportunities. So definitely take advantage of office hours um, at whatever college you end up at because they're wonderful. Something else that is frequently asked is about research opportunities and all of the different um, 
not only research but job opportunities that UVA offers for its students. Um, through various programs such as the UVA Career Center, we have internship placement programs that can help you get access to work both at UVA and in the greater Charlottesville area. Um, for research, I honestly think that the best opportunity for research is just by reaching out to your professors in class. Most of my friends have had a teacher that maybe they were interested in doing research with and they just sent them an email and said, hey, I saw that you're doing research in a biology lab and I'm really interested in that. Could we get in contact and maybe talk about that outside of class? And a lot of times this will lead to maybe getting put in their lab or a different one. Um, but if that's not your style, we also have programs like the Undergraduate Research Network, which is kind of like a LinkedIn for research at UVA. It connects you with all of these different opportunities. And even though this is a picture of the UVA Robotics Lab and the Engineering School, research isn't just limited to science and engineering. UVA has opportunities for research in pretty much any field, ranging from history um, to politics to even music and the arts. So plenty of opportunities to get involved with research, and I think about two-thirds of UVA students will usually do some kind of research project before the time they graduate. So this is a picture of one of our libraries at UVA, Alderman Library, which is currently under construction. Um, this is the McGregor Room, which we affectionately call the Harry Potter Room for probably obvious reasons. And this is one of my favorite study spaces on grounds. Um, luckily, this room is being preserved. So once the renovation of Alderman Library is done, the room will still uh, be intact and remain a wonderful place for UVA students to come together and do some quiet studying in a really great academic space. Um, there are upwards of 12 or 13 libraries on grounds, and overall, all of the academic buildings have ample room for studying with friends or um, finding outdoor spaces to study. That was one of my favorite things during this past semester when we were all spending a lot more time outside. I also want to touch on study abroad opportunities at the university. Um, so about one third of UVA students will go abroad during their time here, and this is largely in part due to the flexibility offered by our education and abroad office. So not only will all of your financial aid transfer with you when you go abroad, um, which makes traveling much more accessible for all students at UVA, um, but you can choose to go abroad for either a fall or spring semester, a summer session, or a January term. Um, January terms are two-week sessions in January, and these often have study abroad opportunities that are targeted for one kind of course. Um, so for example, maybe an art history course that will take you to Venice, Italy. Um, speaking of Italy, this is a picture of a UVA student in Florence, Italy. Um, and there are so many different opportunities to study abroad, not just in Europe, but also in places like South Africa, Australia, and China. So definitely get in touch with the Education Abroad Office and check out their website to see all of the opportunities to study abroad. Next up, I'll hand this off to my friend Kelly, who's going to tell you all about the extracurriculars at UVA. Hi guys, so like Ben just said, my name is Kelly, I'm a third year at UVA, I use she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I'm a Fred, um, from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I study Spanish and Anthropology with a concentration in culture and communication, um, and that was a lot of information, but I'm going to give you even more about extracurriculars uh, at UVA. So what you're looking at on your screen is a picture of our fall activities fair. So this activities fair happens in the fall, and then there's another one that happens in the spring, but the fall one is really the one to be at um, because it's on the first day of the first classes of all the year so basically everybody is at this activities fair. Um, what you're looking at right now specifically is a picture of South Lawn um, but there's an amphitheater uh, kind of area right next to South Lawn that is also just full of people um, and full of these tables that you also kind of see on your screen. Um, at UVA we have about um, I think it's 972, but the number is always growing, but 970 plus student organizations on grounds. So pretty much you can kind of infer from that number that that means there will be organizations of kind of every variety and subject matter and kind of interest group imaginable. Um, and so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to list all of them right now, but uh, just to give you an idea, um, you can even see on the screen there are musical groups, there are sports teams, there is Quidditch if you're into Harry Potter. We have a club that meets once a week to eat waffles together. We have um, advocacy 
advocacy groups and Greek life and community service organizations. And so really, um, whatever you're interested in, I uh, would wager that UVA probably has a club for you. But if, you, if there is not something specifically that kind of speaks to you, it's really easy to create your own club. All you need is a constitution um, and like I think six people who said that they would be interested. And then you've started a club and you can get funding from student council. So it really is that simple. Um, for me personally, two of the clubs that I'm most involved in at UVA are the University Guide Service, which gives admissions and historical tours, and Madison House, which is one of the biggest um, volunteer kind of hubs on grounds, and it connects uh, UVA students with Charlottesville residents to kind of work within and around the community. And so that's been one of my favorite ways to get, uh, to get involved around grounds. Another way that you can get involved besides just joining a club is to attend sports. So what you're looking at on your screen is JPJ. You may know we are reigning men's basketball national champions. We are very proud um, and definitely love to cheer on men's basketball, but we also have a dozen other NCAA Division I sports um, that are also really fun to attend. And what's really cool about these sports games is that they're free for you as a student. So even if we're talking about football or basketball, all you need to do is swipe your student ID and then you can get into the basketball or football game for free, which is awesome. And it's a great way to make cheap memories with your friends while cheering on these teams. Basketball is a little bit more complicated because it operates on a lottery-based system. So basically you enter for a free ticket. Um, but if you want a free ticket, they're really easy to get. And I went to every single basketball game my first year and definitely think that it's an experience you should have at least once while you're here. If you are being recruited for a Division I sport, you would probably know. So in terms of getting involved in actual sports around grounds, uh, we usually like to focus on club and intramural sports. Club sports are about the commitment that you would think of when you think of a high school level sport. So think there's a tryout, sometimes people get cut, you practice every day, and then you travel to go to meets or games or tournaments or whatever um, with teams from other schools. And then intramural sports are much more mellow. So if you're like me and you're not as good at sports as maybe some other people, um, intramural is definitely a great way to get involved and stay active and have fun. One of my best friends joined an intramural soccer team um, our first year with guys from his hall, um, and they lost every single game they ever played, but they had a great time doing it. Um, so definitely another fun way to get involved around grounds. Next thing I want to talk to you guys about is student spaces on grounds. Um, so what you're looking at right now on your screen is the new Multicultural Student Center. I guess it's not as new now that we're in a new year, but this center opened uh, in February of 2020 with a, our new Latinx Student Center, our LGBTQ Student Center, and our Interfaith Student Center. Um, and these spaces are all operated by a branch at UVA called Multicultural Student Services um, that runs programming through them and also is there as a support system for students of different identities. Um, and they're also just spaces for students to gather, um, whether it be with friends or a club or just to study themselves. Um, they're awesome spaces around grounds. Another space to look into around grounds um, is located just outside of grounds. It's called 1515. Um, it's located on UVA's corner, and you can see it right here. It kind of looks like a coffee shop on the inside, um, and it's located, again, just a two-minute walk from grounds on the space called the corner that you'll see in a second. But 1515 is awesome because it kind of has that UVA library study vibe without having to actually be in a library. Um, and I'm sure you guys know that you don't always want to study in the same place, so sometimes when you need a break from the library, 1515 is a great spot to move, take a break, study somewhere else. But it also has a game room in the basement, a cafe in the back where you can use your meal plan, which Eugene will talk about in a little bit, um, as well as rooms upstairs that you can rent out and use, or reserve, I guess, not rent, but you can reserve rooms upstairs to study in as well. It's located on the corner, like I mentioned, which is this little shop uh, or strip of shops and restaurants, which is, again, really close to UVA. So it's a great place to stop for lunch um, in between your classes or hang out with your friends on the weekend. Um, you can even see the 1515 sign on the screen um, in the back. Um, one of my favorite restaurants on the corner is called Bodo's Bagels. Um, you can't see it in the picture, but it's awesome, and it's right kind of next to Mincer's towards the front. Um, and it's the best bagel sandwiches in Charlottesville. Everyone is diehard loyal to them. They're really good. Um, and they're also really cheap, so they're definitely really popular with the college students. Moving a little bit further off grounds um, and away from the corner, we have the downtown mall, which is another place that I definitely recommend visiting. I was just said this morning, we were walking around with my roommate um, because we needed bread. So we went to go get bread from a bakery downtown, which was fun. Um, but it's, again, lots of shops and restaurants. It's a really cute space. Um, and there are lots of festivals downtown. There are events. There are concerts. There are movies you can go see. You can see the Paramount Theater here. But there's another movie theater at the other end of downtown. Um, and it's just a great place to kind of walk um, and get outside of the on-grounds bubble a little bit. But it's also a great place to kind of get outside of that 18 to 22 year old bubble because um, sometimes when you're at school all you see is 18 to 22 year olds for a couple days in a row and you begin to think other people don't exist so downtown is a great way to kind of go to the farmer's market see a cute dog and remind yourself that adults are living their daily lives and that you're not just um, surrounded by people your own age which is kind of fun. 
But with that, I'm going to pass it off to Eugen. She's going to talk to you guys about first year life. Um, so yeah, thank you. Hey y'all, my name is Eugen from Center of Virginia. I'm a fourth year double majoring in sociology and psychology. And I'm going to talk to you guys briefly about your first year experience at UVA. What you're looking at right now is one of our new dorm buildings. As a first year, you're required to live in the dorm unless you're a transfer student. And the dorms are assigned to you randomly. Now let me first pause and tell you guys that there is no longer a difference between a new dorm and an old dorm. Lucky for you all, old dorms have all been renovated to have AC and elevators, and it literally looks like a five-star hotel. The only difference is the location of its clustered areas. You also have the opportunity to live in one of three different type of residence kind of situation. The first type is a hostile dorm, which you normally think about when, it, when you think of college dorm. It's a one big hall with about 20 to 25 people. You share bathroom stalls and common lounge space or a study space. The second type of dorm is a suite style where it feels like an apartment style arrangement. You live with about 10 to 12 people that live in different rooms around a centralized living room space. The third type of college residential experience that you can have is residential college. We have three different residential colleges that you can apply into and 10% of our first years tend to live in one of them. They're themed around different specific kinds of interests that people in them share. For instance, the Hereford Residential College cares about the environmental sustainability. The Brown Residential College states it's for the interested and for the interesting. And lastly, our International Residential College prides itself on providing a diverse cultural experience. Regardless of where you choose to live in your first year, one universal experience that you will all be having is having an RA or a residential advisor. They put on a bunch of programming for you and your homemates to bond together with. There's been small nights where they would collaborate with different dorms for you to really interact and get to know your peers in your class. And also, specifically my RA, we would have like Tea Party Tuesdays where on Tuesdays we can come to the RA's room and just bond, talk, chat, get some food snacks from them. And it's just a great way for you to interact with people in your hall as well. So if you're worried about making friends, do not worry, your RA's got you. They make a comfortable setting and they're always there for you whenever you need them. They're a 24 seven support situation. For roommates, you can pick them in one of two ways. You can pick someone that you already know, someone you may have gone to high school or met on Facebook, or even go entirely random. Everyone who goes random will fill out a survey by the UVA Housing and Residential Life Committee, which questions whether you're a messy or a clean type of person, morning or nighttime, and stuff like that. They will try to match your result with someone who shares the similar living preference as you. So the next thing we usually talk about regarding to first year experience is dining. As a first year, you're required to have a meal plan and you have two options for that. You have the unlimited plan and the super unlimited plan. And this basically means that you will never run out of food and it's always available to you. To offset you from eating the same type of food every day, you have options such as flex dollars and meal exchanges, which comes in both of your meal plans. Flex dollars are basically like extra cash that comes with your plan and you can use it to spend on different on-ground or off-ground locations like food trucks, such as dumpling truck, um, Naco Taco, Five Guys, Papa John's, Ming Dynasty for some Chinese food. Um, meal exchanges function like a normal meal swipe that you can use on places like Chick-fil-A, Subway, Einstein's Bagel. These different options will allow you to never be bored with what you eat. And to close off on your first year experience, we like to talk a little bit about traditions. So UV is really unique because it's over 200 year old institution, which means that you're getting folded into a community that has numer numerous traditions of both new and old. What you're looking at right now is one of my favorite ones. It's the snowball fight that we have every year during our first snow. Everyone comes down to the lawn space together and we all gather at midnight where we basically create forts, throw snowballs, just have good chaotic time with everyone. It's a wonderful way for us to connect and bond with our peers right before finals or just celebrate in the beautiful snow in the place that we love so much. 
we will conclude with that and just say that we're sorry and sad that you couldn't we couldn't welcome you guys in person but we have a virtual tour available for you guys because obviously this isn't the most comprehensive way to look at it so the link is here on this page and we highly encourage you to take a look and feel free to also interact with us. Us interns are constantly available on our Instagram at UVA underscore summer or sign into our chat sessions that we have on Tuesdays and Thursday with this link. And with that, we will move to our Q&A's. All right, thanks all of y'all. Um, and thank you for those of you who are submitting questions in the Q&A feature, y'all seem very active, so keep keep letting us know those. I do want to throw one question to y'all um, about, there was one question that just involved the alumni, and I kind of just want to broaden that question. Um, I know that you can join the alumni association as a current student, <laughs> so like that's one way that you could like you very actively be involved in that organization, but Tell me some of the ways any of you that um, you have seen or either you have personally connected with alumni and what potentially that could lead to in terms of like internships, cool conversations, like whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, I can start. Um, so UVA has a program called Virginia Alumni Mentorship. So once you come in and you join that program, you have access to all the alumni available to you who are ready to help you out. Um, they check up on you each semester or yearly, depending on which program you wish to interact with them. But overall, our alumni are very open to interact. Um, they're always welcome to come to any event hosted by the Career Center. And so they stop by as well to, you know, even get that one-on-one -on -one experience with students and get that face-to-face -face connection. So highly recommend you on that. And we have a lot of uh, alumni mentorship programs that are given to specifically I saw that there was a question on architecture students each of your schools individually have their own career center as well and we also have an overview broad of general career center available to UV students so you have a variety of different career centers available to you to get that interaction along with that within our LinkedIn our UVA account has a specific area where you can see which of our alumni or where most of the students uh, are our alumni tends to end up in so you can access that and interact with them through there so you have a lot of options um ben kelly if you want to join in um yeah. I was just thinking, I think, kelly you go first um this uh semester i decided that i was interested in looking at um internships in management consulting and the uva alumni network in that specific sector was literally so welcoming and kind i'm a humanities major never thought about consulting in my life, don't know anything about business, um, and literally would email people and be like, hi, like, my name is Kelly, I'm a third year at UVA, I know you went to UVA undergrad, and I was just, like, wondering if you would maybe be willing to, like, give me 30 minutes of your time and talk to me about your job, and I talked to literally dozens of people who were like, oh my gosh, like, anything for another Wahoo, like, call if you need anything, like, if you want me to put in a good word, let me know, like, and it was just so reassuring to know that that, like, community kind of stays present, even beyond um, being here, because I know everybody's always kind, and, and getting to events is awesome, but I think, like, even being able to, like, cold email someone and know that they'll probably, like, open your email because um, they care so much about UVA and they, they want to help another student was just really, really cool to see in action. Yeah, and I was just going to add that, um, outside of just professional activities, I've also found ways to connect with alumni through the, actually mainly the performing arts organizations I'm a part of, but, but both my acapella group and the chorus I'm a part of. Um, for example, the University Singers held a virtual, like live YouTube premiere for our family holiday concert in lieu of our normal um, in-person performance because of the COVID pandemic. And it was just so much fun to see it all of the alumni commenting like I was in the university singers in the 90s and like they would reach out to us and say if you ever need someone to talk to there's this incredible community that if you say you're a UVA student people want to talk to you about it and see how the university has changed so you'll definitely have a lot of people who are here for you and rooting for you um, regardless of the activities or jobs that you're interested in. 
Great. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to take a couple that I see that are kind of admission related. One is about um, applying, students who are applying a regular decision or RD. Um, and it was a question about grade trends. So that is something that we look at students who um, you know, might have a rocky start at the beginning of high school, but then they pick it up and they do better throughout. Um, and, and that is definitely something that we consider and we admit those students as well. What we don't want to see though is a downward trend. So just make sure that it's going up. Um, and so students who typically, or students who may have had kind of, like I said, a rockier start at the beginning, I often encourage them to apply regular decisions so that we can see what grades they're earning so far in 12th grade. So that's to answer that question. And then I also saw one um, about scholarships and um, like, we, like I said, we meet 100% of demonstrated need um, for all of our students, so there are need-based scholarships. Um, and we don't really have that many merit-based scholarships to offer, but I encourage students to talk to their counselors because they often maintain lists of scholarships that students can apply to. These local scholarships are often the ones I encourage students to apply to. Right? There are, of course, the national like Coca-Cola scholarship and Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship, but look at the ones that are in your local community because often those will have fewer people applying to them and you often stand a greater chance of getting that. So that's just something to keep in mind there. Um, so that was money. Now I'll talk about another hard hitting issue that I'll throw to y'all. Um, what is the food like in UVA dining? I always tell people that it's aggressively average. Like I would not compare it to home cooked food, but I was never hungry. And now that I'm not a first year, because first year I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sick for dining hall food. But now that I'm not a first year, if a first year will swipe me into the dining hall, I'm like, you are the greatest person I have ever met in this universe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I put like a bunch of fruit in my backpack and go like my merry way. So I think that it definitely grows on you. Um, and I also like, there's always lots of options. So if you don't like, something specific that they're serving that day there's always pizza which my brother is he's second year and he literally got pizza like six days a week and like he always ate um and there's also vegan and gluten-free uh options in every dining hall and you can also work with the dining hall if you have specific dietary restrictions um like there's certain people have specific allergies specific things um and if they like up to the chefs at the dining halls and they'll Great. Thank you. Aggressively average. I like that. I like that. The phrasing. Um, okay. So I think, Ben, did you, were you the one who was talking about research? There's one question about, about research. How easy is it to access? This is specifically asking for science majors, but I think it probably applies to all of the different disciplines that we have. All of our professors are engaging in some type of research, but just kind of talk about what a research opportunity yeah, so specifically for science, I know my first year roommate actually got involved with research for kind of like a biotechnology um, project at UVA. And the way he did that was um, just emailing one of his professors and saying that he was really interested in one particular lecture. And that led to an interview and a conversation about joining their team. And now he's been doing research with them for over two years. And it landed him a summer internship and all this stuff. So a lot of times those random connections can just come out of um, having conversations with your professors. Um, but also for people interested in the humanities, I know a lot of people have made use of the Undergraduate Research Network in addition to USOR, which is a um, similar research network for first generation low income students. Um, so there are definitely lots of opportunities to kind of find all of the different research postings. And a lot of times you'll also just, professors will pass along emails that say, um, for example, like public history research opportunities with um, the Commission for Slavery and Segregation at the university. I've seen a lot of research opportunities helping out um, like making humanities databases for those. So a lot of times the opportunities just fall kind of into your lap via email or something, but also connecting with the UVA Career Center, I think, is a great way to find these opportunities as well. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and so this will be our last question, perfectly positioned to be the last question. Um, fill in the blank, each of you, I'll give each of you. The one thing that you really need to know about UVA but won't find out until you actually get here is, 
And I'll give you all a second to think if you want, but whoever comes up with the answer first, just jump in and that'll be our last question. Yeah, if I can take a stab at this. Um, personally, I would say student self-governance. I know we've told you guys about it and you guys are now aware that, you know, UVA really allows students to have that responsibility, provides that resources available for you guys to really make a change in the school and create an impact, but you don't know until you really get here and understand how much of a responsibility that's really given to you as a student. You're not just a nobody when you come to UVA. Each and every student is very important and they do make a change and an impact to our school. It truly feels like you're leaving a legacy behind as you're about to graduate. And you also understand how much this given right is helpful for us as we move on after post-college. Um, I can go next. I think mine, my, so this is not meant to be a bad thing. It's definitely my favorite thing about going to UVA. And mine is that when you're at UVA, you're never the smartest person in the room. Um, I think that a lot of people who come here come from their high schools and they are usually top of their class at their high school um, and they usually have done really well in school and all of these things and so I think for me personally it took a while for me to realize like I wasn't always going to know more than everybody else in my class and that was something that I wish that I had learned sooner um, because as soon as I started learning that I was so much more able to learn from my peers uh, because I think your peers have so much to teach you not only when you're in class but when you're outside of class and listening to people talk about their passion projects and the things that they care about and the things that they love to learn about and the ways that they've done things and the way that you could do them differently or the ways that you can improve like a, like even just study like habits all of these things like I think I've learned so much from the other people that have been around me um, and I think that wasn't something that I was expecting um, especially being from in-state and so that was definitely my favorite thing that I learned that I wish that I had come into UVA kind of like expecting more. Yeah, and I'll kind of build on that and just say that as an out-of-state student, I really wasn't sure what it would be like finding a community and a place at UVA. Um, and I think one thing that's really important for out-of-state students, and honestly in-state students to know too, is that everyone is coming in hoping to find new friends. And a, a great way to do that is just by making friends with the people in your dorm building, but also um, pursuing your passions through extracurriculars. Um, there, are, as Kelly mentioned before, there are over 900 clubs at UVA, and there's a reason for that. It's because students have such a wide array of interests, and no matter what that is, if it's something in the arts or something with sports or journalism or a multicultural organization, um, you will find people who have a similar background to you and similar interests, and that will just pave the way to friendship. So even if you're a little concerned about going to a Virginia State school, trust me when I say that it's really a community that has people coming from all over and people are genuinely excited to make friends and get to know each other. Um, so yeah, definitely come in with an open mind because um, chances are you'll, you'll make some of your best friends here. Thank you all very much for sharing and thank you all for joining me because I know that y'all are technically on break until February. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here and sharing your experience with everyone. Um, and also thank you to my colleague uh, behind the scenes doing an amazing job. Our queue is empty for the question. So I think we did a, a great job there. Again, if you, um, any of you watching have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to our office, call us, reach out on any of the social media social media that you saw. Um, and again, I want to wish everyone a happy new year and have a great rest of y'all's day. Thanks for joining me. Bye y'all.